Hi, welcome to Catch Fire London's YouTube channel. We're really glad that you joined us today. We really pray that this message inspires you in your relationship with God. If it's in your heart to sow into our ministry uh, to help us uh, fund uh, having things like this YouTube channel, having things like our podcast, uh, we'd love you to partner with us. The link is up here in the corner. Um, and you can give any gift, any amount, and anything that you give will help us uh, continue to grow the media department of this church uh, and make sure that we get the message of Jesus uh, as far and wide as we can. So bless you. Uh, and let me just pray for you as you listen to this message. God, I just pray that as, uh, as my friend here listens to this message, God, that you would just open their hearts to something fresh of you, something fresh of the kingdom, that they would be transformed as they encounter your presence through this message. Amen. No further delay. Can we all rise to our feet and put our hands together for Abby Allsop, lead pastor of Catch Fire London. Leader of many, wife to Tom, mother to us all, really. Father, we just bless Abby. We thank you for the word that's in her heart. Thank you for the prepared life that she leads. And we ask, Lord, that you bless her and bless the message that she's got. And will we leave this place transformed because of what she speaks and your word through her. In Jesus' name. Come on. Amen. thought I was going to get a co-preach there for a minute. With uh, my little friend here. <laughs> oh. How's everyone doing? Good. How's everyone doing? Good. I loved worship this morning. I know worship is not for us to love or really have an opinion on, but I loved worshiping Jesus this morning. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh. Zach and Shanice, I know they're not in the room, but there's something on those guys at the moment. There's just something so sweet in the presence of God and what they brought. So, yeah, we, if you have a moment, if you see them after, just thank them because, you know, they, they have busy lives and they spent time praying and preparing um, for this morning. And, yeah, we just really honor our worship teams. Aren't they awesome? Come on. Well, I'm going to speak this morning on um, returning king, and I'm going to share something um, with you that uh, is a journey that I would love for us all to go on. I'm not stood here um, with, a, with, with years and years experience of having um, studied this in depth. I'm stood as someone who has spent the last month or so digging into the scriptures, um, listening to messages, listening to um, to talks, to reading books, to talking to people, working out, okay, where, where should we be at this time and this season? I don't want to talk about, um, about your belief or my belief about particular end time events, but the one thing that I can tell you, church, is that today is the closest we have ever been to Jesus' return. Today is the closest point in history to seeing Jesus return. And I can tell you that this is going to be a glorious day for the church. It's going to be magnificent. It's what we're hoping for, the hope that we have in our hearts of Jesus' return. This is something to be excited about. And I want to challenge you, when was the last time you thought about Jesus' return? When was the last time that we, um, we fixed our eyes on heaven? And it's so easy to get swept up into normal life. So I want to touch for a couple of minutes just on the hope that we have. I want to remind you of what I hope is already deeply set in your hearts. I want to remind you of, um, of yeah, what I hope is already in there, but maybe just needs bringing to mind again. Now, I didn't want to be reading from my notes a lot, but I find paraphrasing scripture an interesting thing. I feel like the Bible just says it a whole lot better than I paraphrase. So is it all right if I read you some scripture? <laughs> <laughs> so in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made from hands, but an eternal home from heaven. Let me read that again. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not built with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed in our habitation, which is from heaven. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, 
who has given us all things by his spirit as a guarantee. And I'm sure you've all heard Tom's message on uh, the Arabon, the guarantee. If not, look it up. The Arabon, the Holy Spirit given a de- as a deposit for you, like an engagement ring of the hope of things to come. So it goes on to read, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. And I love that analogy of this body, this life being a tent, but God building an eternal home, a building, a building that will last forever for you and for I. And right now we're in this state of a tent, of camping. Is anyone else along with me in that generation of years of Christian camps? Give me a wave. Yes. You know, I've, I have spent more than six months of my life camping. I've spent two weeks a year for many, many years of my childhood and my youth camping at New Wine, at Soul Survivor, at River Camp. Who's done David's tent? Come on, David's tent's awesome. Um, I have spent so, so much of my life, six months spread over many years, camping. And, you know, camping's something that I, I love. I was telling the girls this morning, we were, um, we were reading something together, and we were talking about rain and when we like to hear the rain, and we were talking about when we go camping, and you get to lay in your tent and hear the rain, and there's just something really lovely about it. There's also things not so nice about it. Everyone's like, are you sure? <laughs> we have been in, we've been washed out. There's only been once where it's been so bad that we've had to go home from, um, from New Wine. And that was the year where it was just, it was torrential rain. It was awful. Um, my school friend that I brought with me, she even got seasick from the caravan doing this. She was on the top bunk. She was sick over the bunk in the middle of the night from the seasick. And that was the year where my mum just said, you know what, <laughs> let's pack up, let's go home. Um, we've, had, we've had years where, uh, I mean, anyone who knows me um, knows that I love a bargain, right? <laughs> All the people laughing, they're like, yes, that's you. I love a good bargain. So when me and Tom decided that, you know, we were spending two weeks, half our annual leave every year, serving at New Wine um, as team pastors, that we would invest in a bigger tent. And I found, um, I found online an eight-man tent for 35 quid. I know. Good bargain, right? You know, there's a truth. Sometimes things are, uh, are, what's the phrase? Too good to be true. If it looks too good to be true, maybe it is. This was one of those. We had this tent up, looked great for the first day. The winds came, the storms came, the rain came. We came back from our session and... You could see the outline of our beds and case. It was so flat. (laughs) And it was so bad. It was awful that we had to, um, you know, it it was just like a bin liner on strings. We had to throw this, uh, we had to throw this tent away and spend the rest of the fortnight in a two-man tent that was the size of our blow-up double air bed. And so all we could do at night was open the door and kind of fall into bed and then you're laying on the bed trying to get undressed trying to get into your clothes, into your pajamas. Does anyone like Bear grills? Yeah? We, um, when we went to river camp with Catch the Fire as a family, maybe um, five years ago, a girl came with us from Jersey, and she's like, guys, I've read Bear, G- Bear Grylls' book, and I know the way to not get cold at night. Because who knows, how whatever, however warm it is, you're still cold at night camping, aren't you? Well, I am. Um, She's like, I've read the book. What you have to do is you get into your sleeping bag um, without any clothes on. And then you put your pajamas on in your sleeping bag. So that's the trick, people. But in the morning after she'd done this, she was telling us about it. And she's like, do you know what? The, the, like, it took so much effort to get into my clothes in the sleeping bag that I was so hot and sweaty afterwards. They're like, this is brilliant. This is why it works. She just... And you know those sleeping bags that are kind of that shape. So you're there trying to get undressed, trying to get changed. But you know, when I go camping, you get dirty. You get smellier as the week goes on. You get, you know, your clothes get less fresh. And it's just, you know, it's not a very nice state. 
but I still, I still love it and I enjoy it. But do you know why I enjoy it? I enjoy it because I know that it's temporal. I know that this state of being in a tent is temporal, that there at home is a building with walls, with insulation, with a roof, with a hot shower, and with central heating, and with a fridge, okay, so that the cheese and biscuits that was a great idea didn't, you know, go off and stinky, and when I go camping, I do it, and I love it, because I know it's temporal, it's a temporal state, and it's the same thing with this life on earth, sometimes I think that we get so swept up into the things of this earth, with everyone else, who thinks that camping is all there is, that we start to think camping is all there is and we start to think like the world and we talk like the world and we forget that we're just camping. We're in a tent and that we have, not by humans but by God, a building being built for us, not by human hands but by God. And this is the hope that we have. Amen? So that's the first truth I want to remind you of, that you are in a tent but you have a building being built for you and a forever home. Why don't we just thank Jesus for a minute? Just thank him that he is building you a home. It says in the word that he is building you a house. Let not your hearts be troubled. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Jesus, I thank you that you are preparing a place for me. Jesus, I thank you for the hope that I have. And Father, I just declare this morning that every heart would be reawakened to the reality of what's coming and to fix our eyes again on the hope that we have, to remind ourselves that we don't have to join in with the whole camping experience like the world, but that we can give people a hope and say, hey, I know that you're in flip-flops and your feet are covered in mud and your tent's falling apart, but do you know what? This isn't all there is. Amen? And so where's Jesus right now? Someone shout it out. Yes. I want to give you a picture of what it's like from Revelation 4 and 5. John goes up and he sees the throne room of heaven. And I just want you to picture this glorious picture of heaven, of the throne room, of the glory. So there's a throne with one on it who appears as Jasper and Ruby. Maybe just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you as I read this. A rainbow that shone like emerald encircles the throne. Surrounded the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on those thrones were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and pearls of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. There were four living creatures, and whenever the living creatures give glory to God and honor and thanks, the 24 elders fall down and cast their crowns before the one who sits on the throne. That is the place that Jesus is coming from. And actually, if you read the whole of the two chapters, Revelation 5 and 6, you'll see where your part is in that picture. Because the 24 elders hold 24 bowls. And those bowls are filled with incense. And the incense is the prayers of the saints. So may the month of prayer, let that not just be a month of prayer, but the start of a lifestyle of prayer. That your place in that picture of Revelation 4 and 5 is the prayers of the saints that go up like incense, that minister to the throne, that take a place in that picture of the throne room, the flashes of lightning, the rumblings of thunder in heaven right now, and that your prayers, the privilege that we have, the honor that we have, that our prayers are just a tiny bit of that incense that goes up. Amen? Ah, so Jesus, would you just, would you help us to see you, help us to see where you are coming from? And you know that place, that picture of Revelation 4 and 5. Who knows that Jesus isn't staying in heaven forever? Who knows that Jesus is coming again? And he isn't coming from... He, you know, sometimes we ask the question, when I look back and I think, how, how, when, how when so many people were waiting for a savior, did they miss Jesus? 
when he came humbly, when he came as a baby? Will we miss Jesus coming again? Will he come quietly? Will he come humbly? No, he's coming. He's coming in lightning. It says that the sky will light up from the east to the west, that every eye in heaven and earth, every eye on earth, Every single person will be aware that Jesus has come. There will not be a single person that does not see Jesus coming on the clouds. The two, um, the two angels that descended at Jesus' ascension said, as he left, he will come again. He will come on the clouds. So I want to remind you again today that Jesus is coming. And it seems such a silly thing to say because we are the church. We're the church, but we, I think sometimes we get so distracted with our camping state that we forget Jesus is coming, and this is the hope that we are to look forward to. Matthew 16 says, For the Son of Man is coming in his glory, with his fa- in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will repay every man according to his deeds. You know, so I want to ask today, are you ready? Is there a genuine heart cry within you that says, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus? You know, when I was younger, I had a list of things that I'd really like to happen before Jesus came back. Like, what a, what a kind of ignorance on our parts that we could think anything of earth would be better than the coming of Jesus for the church, coming for his bride. And I love talking of brides. I love the symbolism in the Jewish wedding that the the bridegroom goes to prepare a place. In in the first century Jews, the bridegroom would have left to go and prepare a place, probably for about 12 months, an extension on his father's house. You see the symbolism with, I go and prepare a place for you. There are many rooms in heaven, many mansions. So the father goes, uh, the the bridegroom goes. But do you know the bride is eagerly awaiting. She doesn't know when he'll return. She doesn't know exactly when he'll return. But she's eagerly awaiting. She's preparing herself for her bridegroom. But do you know what else is really interesting? In that Jewish Jewish, uh, wedding, even the bridegroom didn't know the exact time his journey would start. Because the father the bridegroom's father would have to check over all the preparations, make sure all the preparations were done. And it was when the bridegroom's father gave permission for the bridegroom to start his journey back for his bride. So I'm like, Jesus, this is amazing. (sighs) Let me read a few more scriptures about how Jesus will come. Christ will be like the brightness of lightning, illuminating the sky from the east and the west. Bright, loud, and glorious, it cannot be hidden. Behold, he is coming on the clouds, every eye will see him. In Revelation 1, it says, Power and great, he will come with power and great glory, and with the sound of a great trumpet that awakens the righteous dead who are gathered from the ends of the earth first. He will descend with a shout. Like, ah. I even Googled, you know, when I was preparing for this, I was trying to find some dramatic trumpet music and I was like nothing quite hit the spot of how I could imagine that shout that trumpet call when Jesus comes for his bride so are we all on board with the fact that we have an eternal hope and that Jesus is coming and that Jesus is coming loudly and powerfully now when I was talking to um to Hannah Hannah Graham it's probably the first time I've called you Hannah Graham publicly Hannah Jack Graham When I was talking to Hannah about this, I said to her, what would be your take-home message if you were preaching this? Because, do you know, Hannah um, Hannah paid her own way and took six months out of her roles from Catch the Fire and paid to go to IHOP to study the Word, to study um, this among many other things, but just to dive into the Word of God. There are hundreds of, um, of passages about end times in the Bible. And I was talking to her about this, and she said to me, do you know what the the take-home message that I would want to see the church reawaken to is that it's a complete myth that you can't understand end times, that you can't understand revelation. And actually, it's 
it's a mistruth that he's going to come like a thief in the night. Because I think so often, so many of us don't study Revelation and we think, well, we know he's coming like a thief in the night. We know we're not going to know when it's going to be. And we know so many people have got it wrong before. And so, therefore, it's kind of like that excuse not to study it. But I want to um, I want to take you to a couple of scriptures that she showed me. And I hope this morning is just a taster to, um, to get the hunger stirred in you for things to come, to get your heart awakened, to go away and study. And actually, I've talked to Hannah about um, doing a Bible Zoom. For any of you who are interested to join a, a Zoom meeting, um, Zoom is like a Skype, a group Um, a group session where Hannah will take you through the scriptures and not tell you, you know, the right or wrong answer, but present to you, okay, these are the things you need to be thinking about. These are the things that you need to be watching for. Because who knows that the Bible says that we're meant to be watching, carefully watching. Now, if you don't know what you're watching for, how can you watch? How can you be watchful? And who knows the scripture says Who remembers what the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. How do you love the Lord with your mind? How do you love the Lord with your mind? You study his word. You study his word. That's how you love the Lord with your mind. He put 140-something chapters in the Bible about What was promised for you, for his church, for his thousand-year reign, for the end times? You love the Lord with your mind by studying the word. Why don't you just take a moment, just you and God, and say, God, I want to love you with my mind. And if you think you don't have a good enough mind to love him, I want to encourage you that that's an ungodly belief. Your mind is fully capable of understanding the things of God. You are a child of God. It's your inheritance to understand the things of your father. So just take a moment with God. Just If you want to love him with, his, with your mind, just tell him. I want to just show you the scripture around what I've just said. So 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about, um, you know, when the believers are asking about when Jesus is going to come. It says, for you already know, um, when you already know the day of the Lord. Sorry, it's not that scripture when they're asking Jesus. That's in the Gospels. But another time in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, for you already know quite well the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and a thief in the night. But then listen to a couple of verses down. But you, and I'm speaking to you, but you, beloved brothers and sisters, are not living in the dark, allowing that day to creep up on you like a thief in the night. For you are children of the light. We do not belong to the night nor to darkness. This is why we must not fall asleep as the rest do, but keep wide awake and clear headed. So how do we balance this tension between the times that Jesus said, between the times that Paul said, you're not going to know the day, you're not going to know the hour. Same way the bride in a Jewish wedding didn't know the day, didn't know the hour, but she knew, she knew it would be about 12 months. She knew the rough times, she knew the things to look for. In the same ways, we're not going to know the day and the hour, but God gives us a whole bunch of things to look for, a whole load of signs, things that will happen on the earth, things that we can be aware of to know his timings, the things that are happening, the, the season that we're in, so, we can, um, so that we can have an awareness. And no, we're not going to know the exact time and the exact hour. I don't know if you've read anything about the great disappointment in the 1800s, that kind of things where people dig into scripture and then say, this, okay, it's going to be this day. No, it's not going to be like that, but He says we shouldn't, he's not going to come like a thief in the night for the church because he's given the church a whole load of things that Hannah said she'll talk um, talk anyone through who's interested, things to Hannah to look through. And so when, when we say how do we marry up these two things, like 
why are you asking? You're not going to know the day and the hour. And then over here, but you're the church, and here's all the signs, and here's how to be prepared. How do you marry up these two? And Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 24 um, so beautifully. Let me read it to you. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the, the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the floods came and took them away. For this is how it will be at the second coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding um, a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. And Peter, it says, be, be serious and watchful in your prayers. That analogy of Noah, Noah being like the church, being like those who are in the light. Noah didn't know the day or the specific time that the flood would come, but he knew a flood was coming and he adjusted his life accordingly. He adjusted his behavior accordingly. He prepared, he built an ark, he bought oil. Do I need to do that? He bought oil. <laughs> he built an ark. And I want to encourage you today as the church that this is an area that I want to mature in myself. I want to um, break off the lies that I can't understand the signs. And I want to take seriously that God says, Jesus says, be watchful and serious in your prayers. That Jesus is coming. I don't want it to be like a thief in the night for me. I want to be one who is in the light who knows what to look for, who knows that Jesus is coming, and therefore I adjust how I live on earth accordingly. I remember, I am just camping. I am just camping. Really, it doesn't, you know, it, that changes how I view my job and whether I still do my job. It changes how I view um, everything that I do. Now, it doesn't mean that I make rash decisions, that I, not I, but maybe this is a prophetic thing. It doesn't mean that you meet someone who you think could be an adequate spouse, but not the best spouse for you and say, well, Jesus could be coming really soon. So I'm just going to marry them because who knows what might happen tomorrow. We have to be patient in this as well, but to be ready to adjust your lifestyle accordingly and think, okay, this is just my camping. I've got so much to look forward to. And actually, I can help those people whose tents are falling apart to show them what it's all about, really, and to adjust our lives accordingly, to be like Noah. Amen? I think we are out of time. Why don't we stand? In Luke, it says, Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. And church, I'm excited about the journey I've been on over the last couple of months looking at this. I'm excited about how much more I know than I did before or things that I knew in the past but just weren't at the front of my mind. I'm excited that Jesus is coming. And Jesus, we just want to repent right now for a body where we, for us as the leadership where we haven't talked about you coming again, about the glorious hope that we have. But we each, why don't we just each repent for where we have got swept up in the camping and forgotten that we have a building being built, not by human hands, but by the hands of God for us. That we have, you know, it says that God wishes that none would perish. That we, this amazing mystery that his body was broken so that we can be reconciled to the Father. And now somehow we are his body. Corporately, we make up his body on earth and that we have that opportunity both for ourselves to be ready, but also to help other people be ready. So just take a moment, just you and Jesus. I didn't feel like there was anything to call you to the front for or a ministry response other than to say, Jesus, I want to I wanna do what you told me to do and that was to be watchful. And if I'm going to be watchful, I need to know what I'm watching for. And you said the greatest commandment was to love you with my heart, my body, my soul, my mind. And 
Jesus, I thank you that you gave me an incredibly complex and advanced mind, that I have the mind of Christ, and that you reveal yourself to me through the scriptures if I will seek you with my mind, with my heart, but with my mind as well. Jesus, I want to love you with my mind. I want to be watchful. I want to know what to watch for. Yeah, so just take a moment of yourself. Just have a conversation with Jesus, with your bridegroom, who is preparing a place for you, who is proud of you, who adores you, who chose you. And if you feel scared about the idea of Jesus coming again, Honestly, the thought of him coming tomorrow slightly petrifies me because there's so much I wished I could have done first. There's so many choices I wished I could have made differently and that I thought there's time. But if we don't study the signs, how do we know if there's time? And the scripture says to be ready, to be watchful, but also to be ready. So if there's something that you need to get right with God about today, I want to encourage you just make today that day to bring to bring that thing on your heart to him. If there's something you've been struggling with, to bring that to him. Say, Jesus, I want to be watchful, but I want to be ready. I want to be ready. You, beloved brothers and sisters, are not living in the dark. For you all, children of the light and children of the day. My old New Living translation used to say, we belong to the day. We don't belong to the night, nor to darkness. you have kids in by kids and we're going to release you guys to go and grab your kids and bring them down if you're still in this room we've had this whole morning's theme of the victory of God and the faithfulness of his promises don't disengage and this theme that we we do belong to the light and we're not going to be, we shouldn't be surprised when he comes back. The very first picture I ever had as a 15-year-old in a youth group while the worship leader was singing Lord Rain in Me, that old vineyard song, was of a, a watchman standing on a wall and a bright light coming over the hills. And the watchman looking up and the light was sort of almost like smoke but light and it was shooting past at a thousand miles an hour. And as a 15 year old I had no idea what I was 
seeing. I just, I assumed it was something from a movie that I'd seen. I didn't even have a grid for pictures. But it was the watchman waiting for the coming of the Lord and the light that was overtaking the darkness. And yesterday, we're in Marylebone Station waiting for a train, and my wife and my brother in law started playing the piano there. And this group of drama students just next to us started singing. And I think Jake was playing Do You Want to Be a Snowman from, <laughs> from in whatever it is, Frozen. And then they got up, and then they started, Jake and Abby started prophesying over them. And as I came over, the, the first thing I heard was one of them laugh and then them say, I love Christians because they'd just been giving prophetic words. They'd been speaking light. And these guys were the, the most liberal of drama students. They, they fit the stereotype. <laughs> they said, I love Christians because Christians were speaking light into a darkness that they didn't even know they were living in. So why don't we, why don't we stand and ask for the the certainty of the light that we live in to become even more secured, even more rooted, even deeper. But like Abby said, that we are not tent dwellers. We have a home. We have a room in the Father's mansion. And whether you are the kind of person who wanders up to someone in the street and says, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? or whether you're somebody who just feels like you need to get to know somebody before you can start selling them Jesus. Wherever you stand, would you pray that the Father blows on the coals of your heart so that you are able, with integrity, you being you, with the Christ in you, to be able to share the joyous good news that he is a soon coming king. And we're just going to go through, and we, we will do prayer, we'll invite some people up for healing prayer and stuff like that in a moment, but I just feel like we should go through a couple of categories, family, workplace, neighbours, so on. So why don't you just picture your family right now, your relatives, extended family. Father, I pray for every single person, and you just pray for yourself. You start naming some of those guys. Father, I pray that I can be the light to the darkness that's going on in them. Brothers and sisters, parents, grandparents, children, cousins, aunts and uncles, extended family. Lord, that I would be able to be light to the darkness that's in them. That I would be able to bring hope into the family home. The next time we're all gathered together, Lord, that they would see something in me that they cannot deny. Yeah, they would see you, Jesus. Just any prodigals, you've got any prodigal without judging, any, anyone in the family, just raise your hand right now. Just offer that, just lift them up to the Lord right now. Anyone who has not known Jesus, who does not know their Savior, anyone in your family who will experience, like Abby said, Jesus return like the coming of a thief in the night. Anyone who at the moment is going to have no clue what's happening. Lord Jesus, we lift them up to you right now. We ask a special shifting in their life. This year, God, that this would be their year. This would be their year. And just speak out their name. Just say, just say, you, say their name. This is your year. This is your year to know Jesus. This is your year to come out of the darkness and into the light. And let's just pray for our workplaces or where you're spending Monday to Friday or most of your time. Just, just Father, would you, would you bring light through me, in me? Lord, that everybody would see the Jesus in me. That they would see the saviour in me. They would see the light of Christ in me. And just again, pray over your workplace. Pray over a colleague. Every single person in this room is going to have somebody who they're encountering on a regular basis who doesn't know Jesus. So just speak their name out right now. And if you work for a church or a ministry, then pray for your neighbours. Pray for the delivery guys who come to your office every day. 
who don't know Jesus. Jesus, I lift up the post guys who come to catch fire London office every day. As they come in and hear worship music, God, would they want to stay and chat about your presence? And God, we just lift up close friends. Right now, anyone who's got a close friend or somebody in their life who doesn't know you, just, just speak their name out right now. I lift you up. I lift you up right now into the presence of Jesus that you would know him as the returning king. And why don't you just put a, a finger on the shoulder of somebody near you and bless the person. Receive by faith the blessing they're giving you, but bless that person to without striving or without trying to make a show out of it, but with integrity to show the light of Christ wherever it is they go, whatever it is they're doing, with integrity, without trying to do something out of guilt or well, because of a pressure, because you're a Christian, you should do this or do that, but with integrity and with life within you. Bless them to carry the gospel wherever it is that they go. Bless them to fully belong to the day. Well, we want to just invite anyone up who would like to be prayed for. If um, there's uh, some ministry team, any ministry leaders could just make their way around the front.